probably nothing is more critical to a fair trial and a reliable verdict on either guilt or what penalty is imposed than the fairness and the impartiality of the judge presiding over a case. We presume that a judge is going to be fair, that the judge is not going to be pro-prosecution and is not going to be uh, pro-defendant, but is going to call the uh, legal issues that come up in the case, what evidence to admit, uh, what evidence might be suppressed because it was illegally seized or, or taken, uh, how to instruct the jury, that all those decisions are going to be made fairly and impartially. Uh, by the same token, appellate judges are going to review what happens at trial uh, to decide if there's been any error at the trial uh, that may require uh, reversal uh, of the conviction or uh, the sentence. Sometimes judges uh, cannot be fair and impartial, and, and I, a lot of times that's going to be obvious. Uh, the judge is related to one of the lawyers or one of the parties, uh, or for some other reason the judge uh, disqualifies himself or herself, and so no issue is ever presented in the case. But there are going to be cases where the impartiality of the judge is going to be uh, closely contested. And we'll look at a few of those cases uh, today and how courts try to sort them out. Uh, the Supreme Court has said uh, that the right to a fair and impartial judge means that the judge should have no temptation uh, to forget the burden of proof and not hold the balance nice, clear, true uh, between the prosecution and the defense. Uh, another way of putting that is uh, judge may be disqualified if the judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. If an objective person, knowing all the facts involved, uh, had a doubt about the judge's impartiality, then that judge should step aside and another judge should preside over the case where there's absolutely no question that the judge can be fair and impartial. One of the first cases where this came up was Berger versus United States. In this case, in the Berger versus United States case, involved just Land Justice Landis, later to be the uh, commissioner of baseball. Uh, the affidavit claimed that Judge Landis had said, if anybody has anything worse to say about the Germans, or will say anything worse than I have, I'd like to know what it is so I can use it myself. Uh, he said that German-Americans' uh, hearts are reeking with disloyalty, and that he knew a safe blower uh, that he had given nine years uh, and is now a soldier in France, uh, and as between him and the defendant in another case, uh, he would prefer the safe blower. Uh, this comment was made uh, at a time when there was a great deal of uh, uh, hostile feeling towards Germany this was during World War I, uh, a lot of hostile feeling towards Germany and people of German descent. And Victor Berger, the defendant in this particular case, was of German descent and also was a socialist, uh, actually elected to Congress uh, as a socialist. Uh, and he and uh, the co-defendants in this case were saying that with these kind of attitudes, Judge Landis could be fair and impartial in their case. Uh, and so uh, that affidavit is filed. Judge Landis denies it, refuses to take himself off the case. It goes to the Supreme Court, which says, first of all, with regard to deciding the question, the affidavit must be presented under penalty of perjury. In other words, if the person who says that Judge Landis said these things is lying about it, he or she can be prosecuted for perjury, or if it's a lawyer, they can be disbarred. And the court said that's going to be some protection against frivolous efforts to get judges off the case, and it must state facts, not, not rumors or gossip, but facts that show bias on the part of the judge. Uh, the judge, when getting an affidavit like this and a motion to disqualify the judge, simply looks at the affidavit, and based upon what it says, and assuming the facts to be true, the judge can't say, I deny every single fact you've said here. The judge looks at it, and if it appears that the judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned, it's the responsibility of the judge step off the case, recuse themselves, and, and let another judge uh, take over the case. Go no further, let the case be assigned uh, to another judge. That's what the Supreme Court held here. Uh, the prosecution or the defense may know of bias on the part of a judge, uh, but judges also have a duty uh, to disclose any uh, bias under the Code of Judicial Conduct, which this is the ABA model code. Now, each state has its own version of this, but there's not much difference 
uh, Rule 2.11 says the judge will disqualify himself or herself in any proceedings in which the judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned, what I talked about. So the judge has the first responsibility to disqualify. If the judge doesn't disqualify, then the affidavit is filed like the one in Berger versus United States. The judge passes upon it. The procedure may be very different uh, in the state courts uh, where there may be a hearing by another judge, there may be evidence taken, there may be more development of the record and some determination of the truth or uh, false, uh, falsity of the allegations, uh, but that's going to vary from, from place to place. Uh, among, uh, so what kind of disqualifying bi biases might a judge have? Uh, personal opinion, the judge has already made up uh, his or her mind. Uh, somebody supported the judge in the campaign, gave a lot of money, maybe was the judge's campaign manager and is now the lawyer for one side. Uh, one case involved a claim of race discrimination and the judge made the comment outside of court, well, I know that person and that person would never discriminate. Well, if the judge thinks that, then the judge shouldn't be sitting on that case and so another judge uh, would decide that case because that personal relationship. Uh, sometimes the judges have knowledge of the facts uh, such as being a witness or otherwise knowing facts about the case which might uh, disqualify them. Uh, usually this has to be extrajudicial knowledge, uh, not knowledge the judge gained in presiding over the case, but knowledge the judge has from outside uh, which is not properly uh, considered uh, in the case. Uh, misconduct during the trial, uh, very seldom is a case going to be reversed because of a judge's misconduct during the trial. That is, the judge berates one lawyer, humiliates the lawyer, uh, rules against the lawyer all the time. The, the remedy for that, the courts say, most of the time is to appeal uh, the conviction. Uh, but that may be a very unsatisfactory remedy because the Court of Appeals may very well say, well, what the judge did was improper and wrong, but it wasn't harmful enough that we're going to reverse the conviction. So there the defendant is with no relief uh, for what happened uh, dur during the trial. Um, pecuniary interest, uh, this is the, probably the easiest one. If a judge gets some money out of the deal, then obviously uh, the judge can't really be fair and impartial. There are some cases where the judges would get part of the fine. So a defendant comes before the judge uh, on a traffic matter, say, and if the judge imposes a, a fine, a percentage of the fine goes to the judge. Now, the Supreme Court said you can't do that uh, because obviously the judge has an incentive to find people guilty and fine them since the judge is getting a cut of whatever fines are being brought in. Uh, in the Edna Life Insurance uh, case, uh, it was a little bit different. It was a case about uh, insurance companies uh, and one of the judges on the Alabama Supreme Court got a pretty good settlement in a case as a result of that very decision. And the Supreme Court said, no, that violates due process because the judge had a direct pecuniary benefit uh, from the case. That's not going to be uh, the case in criminal cases generally. Um, I want to talk a little bit about racial bias, which is one other uh, kind of bias that is not raised a whole lot, but is often present in cases. And I want to look at a couple of three cases here where it was raised. Uh, it may be behavior off the bench, such as the Louisiana judge who wore blackface to a Halloween uh, party uh, and said he didn't mean to offend anyone, uh, but he was sent to a, uh, uh, some sort of a sensitivity class and was allowed to become a judge. Uh, the judge in North Carolina who made a lot of racist jokes uh, had to step down as chief judge, but continued to stay on the bench uh, as a judge despite questions raised about the judge's ability to be fair and impartial in cases involving uh, African-American defendants. Peak versus Florida uh, was a case uh, in which the Florida Supreme Court, after reversing the case for an era that took place during the sentencing phase of the trial, noted that the judge, in referring to the defendant's family, had used a racial slur uh, in describing them. Uh, and the court said, just for future guidance, uh, we're telling judges that you should avoid the appearance uh, of impropriety. Uh, this judge, had he been a sportscaster or had he been some prominent public figure, 
would almost certainly have lost his job. Uh, but as a judge, uh, he is just simply told, keep your uh, racist thoughts to yourself, uh, and tomorrow and the next day and every day from now on, he can preside over cases, despite having shown this racial bias in this one uh, particular case. Well, there are two cases out of Missouri, both decided the same year, uh, State versus Smalls and State versus Kinder, uh, both involved issues of race racial bias on the part of the judges. In one case, the Missouri Supreme Court finds racial bias, and in the other case, it doesn't. Let's take a look at those cases and whether there's a difference in what happened. Uh, the first case uh, was Smalls. Here you had Judge Carrigan, who is presiding over the jury selection process. And the defense lawyer is making an assertion that the prosecution is striking jurors on the basis of race. And so, the defense lawyer wants to make a record of every person the prosecutor struck, whether that person was black or white. And when the uh, defense lawyer asks the judge to note that one juror is African American, the judge says, I don't know what it is to be black. Uh, I don't know what constitutes black. Uh, there's some dark complected people in the jury, but I don't know if that makes them black or not. I don't know uh, what constitutes black. Years ago, they used to say one drop of blood uh, constitutes. Smalls raises this on appeal, saying the judge is disqualified because these remarks that were made in responding to this uh, show racial bias uh, on the part uh, of the judge. Uh, judge White writes for the majority, the only African American on the Missouri Supreme Court, uh, and frames the question this way, whether there's an objective basis upon which a reasonable person could have a doubt about the racial impartiality of the trial judge in this particular case. Uh, points out that uh, the context of this statement that was made was in the midst of a race-centered issue. In fact, the, the issue here was, was there discrimination against black people? Uh, and also, uh, the dissenting opinion accuses the majority of being hypersensitive. Uh, but Justice White, Judge White says, uh, this is just simply acknowledging uh, that prejudice is very often subtle, that it's not as blatant as it used to be. Uh, but when we see this kind of coded language used and see the judge obviously resistant to a Supreme Court decision which had said that there couldn't be discrimination against blacks, and he's basically saying, I don't even know what black is, I don't know how we can tell who's black and who's white. In this situation, given the context, given what the judge said, the one drop of blood, all of that, the judge is disqualified from any further proceedings in this case. Uh, judge Limbaugh dissents. Uh, he says the trial judge is insensitive, but he's not racially biased. This is what often is the response to claims of racial bias, that it's insensitivity. Uh, and uh, Limbaugh says the judge was just having difficulty figuring out who was black and who was white uh, in the jury pool. Um, in the next case, the Kinder case, uh, Brian Kinder, that Justice Limbaugh will be writing, uh, and we will see that much of what the court said in Smalls is going to be uh, set aside, or, or, or the law in this area is going to be rewritten uh, just a short time later uh, with Judge uh, Limbaugh in the majority. Here's what happened in Kinder. Kinder is about to go to trial in a death penalty case. Uh, six days, Brian Kinder is an African American, Six days before trial, the trial judge, Judge Blackwell, decide, announces that he is changing political parties. He's running for re-election uh, that year, and he says that he is switching from the Democratic to the Republican Party because the Democratic Party places too much emphasis on minorities such as homosexuals, people who don't want to work, and people whose skin is any color but white. And he says it's time for us to place much more emphasis on the hard-working taxpayers in this country. Uh, Kinder says, wait a minute, I'm facing trial just six days from now. The judge has basically said that the Democratic Party represents homosexuals, people who don't want to work, and people whose skin is any color but black, uh, and suggesting that he is for the hard-working taxpayers. Uh, this suggests 
an appeal to race, uh, which shows the racial bias, and therefore he should be disqualified. Again, context is important here because had this uh, press release been issued at no significant time, uh, it might have been seen as, as a bit distasteful, but, but, but not as uh, relevant to a legal issue. But here it's issued just six days before a capital trial. Well, as I said, uh, now Judge Limbaugh is writing uh, for the majority, and he says recusal is not required. One, because we presume that judges act with honesty and integrity in making their decision. Uh, Judge Blackwell had said at one point uh, that everybody is absolutely entitled to their constitutional rights, whether they're yellow, red, white, or polka dot, which maybe suggested a certain amount of sarcasm there. Uh, according to Judge Limbaugh, uh, the judge did in fact give a fair trial. So he was true to his word. He gave a fair trial. Uh, and then this distinction that the press release that was issued was a political act, that it was not a judicial act, but a political act, and therefore it didn't come into play. Uh, and the, Limbaugh now wants to distinguish the Smalls case by saying the reason the judge in Smalls was disqualified was because he wouldn't follow the law, because in, in this race discrimination case, he wouldn't recognize the race of a juror uh, and wouldn't follow the law. Uh, judge, judge White, who wrote Smalls, takes issue with that uh, in his dissent. He calls the press release uh, pernicious racial stereotype, race-baiting nonsense, uh, suggesting that minorities are not hardworking people uh, and that you can't disregard this uh, just simply because the judge says that he can be fair. Uh, judges will often say they can be fair. The question is whether a reasonable person looking at the facts would think the judge did or did not harbor any bias. Of course, what Kendra's worried about is that the judge running for re-election, having now uh, changed political parties, may be tempted and remember that, that standard, whether the temptation is not to hold the balance nice, true, and clear between the defendant and the state, whether there's now a temptation to use this capital trial and the rulings in this capital trial in a way that will help the judge's uh, political fortunes. Um, he also says the majority mischaracterizes his opinion in Smalls that it wasn't about a willingness to follow the law. It was that a judge be free from the appearance of racial prejudice against a defendant uh, or any racial group. He also suggests that what Judge Blackwell did in issuing this press release was perhaps more egregious than what happened in Smalls. In Smalls, the judge has an outburst in the middle of jury selection when the lawyer says, uh, I want you to recognize that this juror is black, and the judge goes off and says, I don't know what black is, and, and goes into that uh, those words we looked at a moment ago. Whereas here, uh, this is a press release. Uh, this is an appeal to the voters. This is something that's put together, that's proofread, that's uh, refined, uh, and then announced at a press conference uh, and is actually a stronger indication, Justice White suggests, than um, the, the, what happened in, in Smalls. Uh, but he's all by himself. Justice White is all by himself in dissent. Uh, in this case, so these cases are decided by uh, the Missouri court uh, and um, do not see this kind of issue come up very often, uh, but probably should be raised uh, more often. Uh, this brings us to our next issue, which is political pressures on judges. Uh, are political acts and political considerations uh, separate from judicial acts? In the federal courts, the judges are appointed by the President of the United States and subject to confirmation by the Senate. Once they're confirmed, they're, they have their jobs for life. They may be ambitious and they may want to move to a higher court or they may want some other uh, political advancement, but at least they are secure in the jobs they have. Not so in the state courts. In the state courts, the judges run for election every four or six years. In some states, the judges are up for a retention election that is just a vote yes or no, whether to keep that judge in office or not. Or judges run head on in states like Alabama and Texas. Uh, judges run under party labels, Democrat, Republican, uh, against each other. 
and as we will see with a full array of campaign advertisements which are growing and growing and growing as the amount of money funneled into judicial campaigns increases uh, with every election uh, cycle. Uh, so uh, before one election, uh, voters in Alabama saw this advertisement, which involved a young lawyer who's getting a call from the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court. Tom, it's Chief Justice Hornsby. Judge Hornsby? Well, good morning to you, sir. You want what? <clears throat> $500 for your campaign from each member of the firm? Well, now you know, Judge, we do have a case pending in your court. It doesn't matter. Yes, sir. I'll get the money over to you right away, sir. Isn't it? You might imagine that it would be a little disturbing uh, to people to think of judges, whether it be the chief judge or any other judge, dialing a lawyer who has a case before that judge for money for their campaign. Uh, but today it's quite frequent. In fact, today it's not unusual for a cam candidate for a state Supreme Court to have a fundraiser uh, sponsored by prominent lawyers who have cases before that judge uh, for the judge to come. Sometimes the fundraisers are held at law firms uh, or it may be held uh, somewhere else, but the judge may come and shake hands and thank people uh, for making the contribution. So there's no uh, secret about who is supporting the, these committees of uh, people, usually prominent lawyers from all different walks of life who are supporting the judge. Uh, so the question comes, when you, when you have that kind of financial support, that kind of public support for the judge, uh, can the judge still be fair and impartial? Uh, and judges are generally going to face far greater attacks than what Chief Justice Hornsby faced. Uh, it's not just going to be a matter of uh, whether they solicited being called out for soliciting campaign funds, uh, but generally uh, it's going to be about decisions the judges made in criminal cases. Very often these cases are really, or these elections, are really a fight between the business community that's interested on caps, on punitive damages in civil cases, uh, or, or other civil matters, and between the plaintiff's bar, uh, which does not, that is the lawyers representing people who are suing insurance companies or businesses or whoever and are trying to win as much money as they can. But the campaigns aren't about that. The campaigns are most often about issues of criminal justice. And uh, we'll look at one, uh, Penny White uh, voted off the Tennessee Supreme Court. Uh, this was a retention election in which shortly before the election uh, suddenly uh, people started to get mail that said that Penny White had voted to free uh, this man, uh, Odom, who had committed this awful crime. In fact, the court had not freed him. It had just simply reversed his death sentence and sent the case back for a resentencing where he was again sentenced to death. But judges have been voted off the courts a number of times, particularly for their votes in death penalty cases. Uh, three in California in 1986. And since then, on the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, on the Mississippi Supreme Court, uh, Justice White, uh, and of course locally, that has happened as well. A trial judge in a local community, maybe three or four counties, uh, has to know uh, that if he or she makes a controversial ruling or an unpopular ruling uh, in a death penalty case, it can very well cost them uh, the election uh, when, when they run uh, for uh, re-election. That if they uh, rule in favor of a defendant in a capital case, no matter how clear the law is that that ruling is required, uh, they may be signing their own political death warrant uh, if they do that. Uh, in 2010, Chief Justice of Illinois was on the ballot for retention election, a yes or no election. Uh, business interest uh, raised about $670,000 for the campaign against him. Uh, but the campaign wasn't about business interest, as, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, Kilbride's uh, committee raised $2.8 million. 1.4 of that came from the Democratic Party and about uh, $460,000 from the uh, Illinois Federation of Teachers. Uh, quite a bit of money uh, spent on a retention election, and most of it went into 30-second ads. Uh, there were many ads and many ads about crime 
But here are some actors uh, portraying uh, inmates in prison in one of the ads that was run against uh, Chief Justice Kilbride. I was convicted of stabbing my victims with a kitchen knife. Of shooting my ex-girlfriend and murdering her sister in front of our child. Of sexual assault on a mom and her 10-year-old daughter. Then I slashed their throats. On appeal, Justice Thomas Kilbride sided with us. Over law enforcement or victims. Other judges overruled Kilbride and our appeals were denied. Kilbride chose criminals' rights over and over again, way more than any other justice. Vote no on retention of Thomas Kilbride. Vote down ballot. It's a top priority. Kilbride had many ads run against him saying that he put uh, criminals over victims or criminals over other people. Uh, the next ad was run against Lewis Butler, the only African American on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Uh, and look for the racial implications uh, of this ad. Again, uh, the sort of uh, theme that ran through the campaign against Butler was that he was loophole Louis, that he always found a loophole to get criminals off on. Uh, Unbelievable. Shadowy special interests supporting Lewis Butler are attacking Judge Michael Gableman. It's not true. Judge, District Attorney Michael Gableman has committed his life to locking up criminals to keep families safe, putting child molesters behind bars for over a hundred years. Lewis Butler worked to put criminals on the street, like Reuben Lee Mitchell, who raped an 11-year-old girl with learning disabilities. Butler found a loophole. Mitchell went on to molest another child. Can Wisconsin families feel safe with Lewis Butler on the Supreme Court? This was a very misleading ad. Uh, Butler did not rule on Mitchell's case as a member of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. He had represented Mitchell when he was a public defender long ago, early in his career, uh, before he became a member of the court. Second, uh, Mitchell did not get off on a loophole. He served his entire sentence uh, in prison. And also notice at the end of that ad, the merger of the faces of Reuben Lee Mitchell, the criminal, with Lewis Butler, both black men, both wearing glasses, and this sort of almost like Butler uh, is the personification or the representation of Mitchell uh, to the voters of Wisconsin. Uh, Gableman uh, uh, beat Butler in this election uh, and now sits on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Uh, well, these kinds of ads raise lots of questions about how judges behave, both what influence it has on their uh, seeking office, what they're willing to promise to get office. And there are two things that we're concerned about here. One, how do we get the best judges? Uh, are we better off with a nominating commission that tries to select people on the, on, on the basis of merit? There are always going to be politics involved, and there will be there, too. Uh, but that's a system that some states have. Uh, or are we better off with a, uh, an election system in which anybody can run for judge and we have a knockdown drag out campaign that's pretty much decided on the basis of 30 second ads, at least statewide campaigns are. Now that wouldn't be as true for a local judicial election. But the second question is how once a person is on the bench, however they got there, how do we make it possible for the judge to decide the case on the law? to decide the case based on the law without any fear that if the judge calls it as the law requires, that the judge is going to remain in office and has the, uh, the, the protection uh, that an unpopular ruling uh, will not be a basis for uh, being voted out of office. Judges are not like legislators, presidents, other people who are supposed to represent the public will. Uh, responsibility of a judge is to uphold the law even when it's unpopular. Uh, free speech, and even when somebody has a very unpopular thing to say, the judge's responsibility is to say, under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, you have a right to say these things, or to parade in this area, or to publish this newspaper, whatever it may be. And by the same token, in criminal cases, when there's a tremendous amount of the passions and the prejudices of the moment coming into the judicial process, it's the judge's responsibility to hold back those forces, to grant the change of venue, uh, maybe to another jurisdiction, although that may, that may make the judge's constituents unhappy because they wanted to decide that case, or to continue the case until a later time after some of the passion has died down. 
uh, a number of decisions that judges are going to be made, uh, making uh, that may or may not be influenced by politics. Well, I'll, I'll end this series of ads with one of the most upbeat ads uh, that's run in the last few years. This was Sue Bell Cobb uh, running for Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. Sue Bell Cobb was raised in Evergreen, Alabama. And Sue Bell Cobb's values, her faith, her family, shine brighter every day. This light of mine. She graduated at the top of her class and with honors from law school and became Judge Sue Bell Cobb, a pioneer for women judges in Alabama history. She put thousands of criminals in jail. Her house was firebombed, but Judge Sue Bell Cobb only grew stronger, more determined. She served 40 counties, and today Judge Sue Bell Cobb decides life and death. While all those years outside the courtroom, Judge Sue Bell Cobb became a state and national leader, a reformer helping children stay out of jail, a southern woman, kind and caring, strong and determined. Judge Sue Bell Cobb is everything our Chief Justice should be. Pretty good advertisement for use in the Bible Belt. Uh, also, as I said, one of the few positive advertisements. And that year, uh, on the entire ballot in Alabama, the only Democrat who got elected to anything was Sue Bell Cobb, who got elected Chief Justice of Alabama. Uh, she later uh, retired as Chief Justice, but she did... Uh, win that election. So at times, uh, a positive approach, although there were plenty of negative ads as well uh, that ran uh, in that election cycle, uh, but uh, uh, that ad was seen as having played a big role uh, in her success as uh, being elected to the court. Whether or not that's what should be deciding who sits on our courts or not is a question I will leave for you to think about. Uh, the independence of the judiciary. The judges are independent, that they decide cases based on the law and the facts without any other political, financial, any other uh, influence whatsoever uh, is one of the most important issues uh, in our society today. Uh, is justice for sale? Uh, are good people discouraged from being judges because they don't want to go through these elections with these negative ads? They don't want to have the one case that they decided in which, and of course, the court is always going to reverse some case. So if you go back through a judge's whole record, you're going to be able to find some case where the judge set aside a conviction. Can you take that one case, blow it all out of proportion, and suggest that that case, like with Penny White, that the Odom case was everything that Justice White stood for uh, over her long career uh, as a, both a trial uh, judge, as an appellate judge uh, in, in Tennessee. Uh, money and politics are at odds uh, with a fair and impartial judiciary. But today, money and politics play a greater and greater role uh, in who's elected to the bench and who presides over cases, and it has a big effect on the fairness of trials and on the behavior of appellate judges in deciding whether to affirm or to set aside a death penalty case or any other criminal case because of a constitutional violation.